I want to thank, uh, thank you, Jean, in advance uh, for the wonderful ways you've been leading us in a reflection on this theme of healing and enlightenment through our brokenness. And I think you, you show us what you see, have seen over the years, what you see every day in the community of L'Arche, both here at Trolli and around the world, and what you see and what you have shared is, uh, seems to me, of tremendous value and importance for the crisis that we are passing through in this period of our history. And you help us to see reality as it really is, and that means penetrating through so many of the complex or false uh, or clever uh, uh, explanations of reality that we construct and argue about or have opinions about, but being able to go straight through to the, the simple, true essence of things is, is your gift. And to show us in what the mystery of Christ and mystery of the Spirit uh, really consists in the union of opposites, being able to transcend those primal fears and discover the confidence of being, the reality of love as an ever-present companion and teacher and guide. Uh, and the meaning of what we call sin in theological terms, by which we often today mean something quite legalistic. You know, sin is the breaking of a rule or the breaking of a moral injunction, uh, and sin becomes sin either when you're caught or when you uh, feel guilty about something. But I think you uh, help us to see that sin really consists in what, in the wisdom of the early, the early uh, Christian teachers, it's a missing the mark, it's falling short, hamartia is the Greek word, of course, for sin, and it means literally that, uh, not hitting the target, falling short. And if we, if we fall short of something, uh, we don't hit the target, then punishment is not the answer. It's training is the answer, and trying again is the answer, and, uh, and, and being encouraged to persevere is the answer. So this understanding of sin, I think, is vital for the recovery of the authority of the Christian wisdom in our world. And you speak about the preciousness of each human being, and I don't think we can really understand the full meaning of that and the whole value system that it, that it presupposes or that it creates to see every human being as equally precious, essentially. What a revolutionary, indeed, what an evangelical vision of reality that is, and it has to be shown has to be lived, we have to try to live it rather than just conceptualize it and uh, talk about it. And it's only in that that we can really discover, uncover, and reveal that experience of communion, which is a community, which allows the space and the creates the conditions in which human beings can learn to persevere, can live with their faults and learn to be accepted and to reduce the power of the superego from judging ourselves or judging others 
and recover a gentleness of spirit, that gentleness that you recognized in St. Francis. So, um, I thought uh, in the light of, of what you've been saying, we might look at a healing uh, story from the Gospel of Mark. It seems to bring together many of the themes that you've been, you've been speaking about and helping us to understand. Let me just uh, read it maybe with a few comments along the way. I think the story itself speaks to us and it, it could also bring us some, uh, uh, m some, some substance to talk about in the small groups that we'll be having uh, after this uh, session. When Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, Jesus is so often shown in the Gospels as being on a journey in transition between one place and another. A large crowd gathered round him and he stayed by the lakeside. Then one of the synagogue officials came up, Jairus by name, and seeing him, fell at his feet, like the rich young man the other day in our Alexia, and pleaded with him earnestly, saying, my little daughter is desperately sick. Do come and lay your hands on her to make her better and save her life. Well, that appeal, it contrasts perhaps with the more complex mind of the rich young man in that story. Jairus is not playing any games. He's desperate. And his, his appeal is utterly simple and sincere. Jesus went with him and a large crowd followed him. They were pressing all round him. Jesus so often in the Gospels is shown in this contrast between solitude and community, or solitude and, and, and large numbers of people. And yet even in the crowd, as we'll see in the next part of the story, he remains himself. And that's what solitude I think really means. It's the solitude that we're led into in meditation. It's not so much about withdrawal or Jesus needed, like we all do, time apart, time alone, time in a quiet place, time on retreat. But solitude itself doesn't mean only physical withdrawal. We have, as with different temperaments, different personalities, we have uh, maybe different needs of solitude of, in terms of withdrawal, time apart. Some people need a lot of it. Some people can get by with just a little. But essential solitude that we see in Jesus, and it's the source of his authority and his power that we, that we see in this uh, passage, is the absolute uh, humble confidence in his own skin, in his own identity. He doesn't need, as it says in the Gospel of John somewhere, he doesn't need to win anyone's approval. He doesn't need an audience to justify himself. He doesn't have to put on a show. He's utterly himself. And in meditation, I think we, we discover solitude. It's why some people run away from meditation, because the solitude I experience begins to frighten them at some point. But it isn't about loneliness. It's not about isolation, quite the reverse. Solitude is the discovery and the embracing of our own uniqueness that each one of us miraculously is unique, however much we have in common 
culturally, religiously, ethnically, we are unique. And ex experiencing, discovering that is a challenge to us because it can make us frightened, frightened of being alone, frightened of being alone in the cosmos. And yet it's only when we do discover that's that meaning of solitude and are comfortable with it that we are capable of the deeper relationships that we all need and thrive on. Otherwise we're condemned to very superficial, very shallow, very transient sort of relationships. It's only in that deeper solitude that we're capable of the relationships in which we are able to truly grow. So here we are, Jesus in the crowd, and yet clearly un unaffected by the crowd, not, not affected by his opinion polls or the ratings or the, the temporary popularity, but himself. So anyway, so he's, he goes with Jairus to, to see the little girl who's desperately sick. The crowd is following him, pressing all around him. He's a celebrity. He's, there's a, there's a, it's, a, it's a special event. And then, if you were making a film of this, you would zoom in on one woman in the crowd. And this is a woman who had suffered from a hemorrhage for 12 years. After long and painful treatment under various doctors, she'd spent all she had without being any the better for it. In fact, she was getting worse. So, I think by the conventions of the time, with that kind of condition, she shouldn't have been in the crowd anyway. She should have been hiding somewhere um, in her shame. But she had heard about Jesus, and she came up behind him through the crowd and touched his cloak. So she doesn't appeal to him in the way that Jairus did. But there is contact, and contact of a frightened, ashamed, nervous, maybe guilty person, but desperate in her own way. If I can touch even his clothes, she had told herself, I shall be well again. And the source of the bleeding dried up instantly and she felt in herself that she was cured of her complaint. So it worked. And what would she want to do at this point? Just slip away quietly. But she's only being cured. And curing isn't enough by touching the hem of his garment, his cloak, uh, she has established a relationship. And even though he is surrounded by a jostling crowd, he is immediately aware that power had gone out from him in a solitary way. What does that mean? In a unique way. So the solitude, his own solitude, is encountering her solitude, her uniqueness. The difference between them is that she is still isolated in her fear, her guilt, her self-rejection, her shame. She hasn't got over that yet. She's just had a physical cure. His solitude is a fully integrated and realized uniqueness, capable of 
relationship, unique relationship, with every person in that crowd. So what we can see here is a, in a very uh, graphic human way is something of the, the nature of the, of the divine being in God's love for us. The ego, the human ego, as we heard John speaking about the, the children and the sibling rivalry, the human ego, even at a very young age, demands exclusive attention, the exclusive possession of whatever love there is around, especially, of course, the parental love. And anything that seems to that child to represent a diminishing of that total and exclusive love is felt to be a threat and creates jealousy, anger, pain, grief, possessiveness. And that continues for at least the next 60 years. So, uh, the ego cannot handle divine love. The ego cannot even handle human love. It demands exclusive and unique, uh, you, you exclusive attention. What we learn gradually, what Jesus is showing here, is that the attention, the love that God is and that we are called to recreate, reproduce, and share in, is not exclusive, but is unique, is solitary, is unique for each one of us. And it is adequate for each one of us. It fulfills and recognizes and accepts everything that we want to be recognized in ourselves, everything we want to be understood, everything we want to be accepted in ourselves, all of that happens, but without exclusivity. And that's where the ego has to let go. So, and if it doesn't let go, in our conception of God, one of the tragedies we end up with is religious fundamentalism. My God my God who I have created into a huge, ugly projection of my ego. Exclusive, dominating, controlling, only too human in the worst of what it is to be human. So we see in the, already we see in this story Jesus responding to Jairus and with, with total sympathy, empathy, immediate response to that appeal of, of a father for his sick child, and to the woman with the hemorrhage on the way to Jairus's house. If you were, again, making a film of this, you might, it would have an interesting uh, challenge about how to, how to show Jairus at this moment probably a little impatient. Come on, come on. Uh, yes, I know she needs it, but my daughter's very sick. You can come back to this woman later. Anyway, we don't get into those details. But the, 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 the meaning of it, I think, is that, is that the power of Jesus, that he feels, he knows consciously, is going out of him towards each of these people who need him individually, that that power is adequate for the whole crowd, in fact, for the whole human race, and for every generation. It's adequate because the love that is going out is the power of God. So, and if we, as his disciples, possess the mind of Christ, 
if that power of the Spirit is with us as his body, as his church, then the church is adequate for the needs of the world. We don't have to be exclusive. We don't have to be penny-pinching. We don't have to be judgmental. We don't have to ring-fence the ways in which compassion and mercy, as uh, Pope Francis is emphasizing, pours out towards those in need and around us. We don't have to ration it. So, immediately aware that power had gone out from him to this unique individual, Jesus turns around in the crowd and asks and says, who touched my clothes? Rather ridiculous question when you're being so, you know, when you're surrounded by a large crowd, like being, I was stuck on a subway, well, I was on a subway train in the rush hour the other day, and, um, you know, you're all piled in on top of each other. Nobody's um, communicating, of course, with each other, but everybody's on top of each other. And, and you can see just how wars start, or riots start, because there was, was one man who was, had his elbow in my ribs and because he wanted to have that little extra two centimeters of space to be able to keep his hand up where he wanted it. And it drove me mad. <laughs> <laughs> it was just so selfish. And, you know, we, did, we didn't have a discussion about it, but uh, how, how, how easily... Uh, when you're in that, uh, you know, when you're crowded and life is, modern life is very crowded, both physically and mentally and emotionally, uh, we don't seem to have the space that we, that we need. And we fight, we fight for space. So anyway, Jesus' response was much more generous than mine. And uh, he simply said, who, who touched me? Who touched my clothes? His disciples said, look, you see how the crowd is pressing all around you, and uh, yet you say, who touched me? Well, the crowd didn't touch him. But this woman touched him. And that connection was, is, the important healing meaning of this, of this encounter, of this relationship. But he continued to look all around to see who had done it. So I think the story, I mean, the message here is that he didn't know. He didn't have this, you know, magic omniscience. It's a little bit like the story I, when the Buddha was giving a talk somewhere and he had a skeptical uh, man in the audience who said, uh, so you're supposed to be the Buddha, are you? You're fully awakened, you know everything. So he said, what's my name? Where do I come from? <laughs> and the Buddha's response was, yes, I know, but I only know what I need to know. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, he, it, I think I, I would read this, Jesus doesn't yet know who touched him because that person has not yet revealed herself to him. And that's what relationship is about. It requires risk, openness, trust uh, on both sides. And then the woman came forward. So he continues to look around to see who had done it. The woman came forward frightened and trembling. So why is she so frightened now? She's being cured. Why doesn't she just disappear, melt back into the crowd, happy that she doesn't have to spend any more money on doctors? Well, perhaps it's because that power has created the beginning of a relationship. There is a, a connection between them. And she knew 
what had happened to her. That was part of her fear. It was overwhelming. It's like when Peter had that big catch of fish and uh, he falls at the feet of Jesus and he doesn't say, thank you for giving me a, a big catch of fish. He, he says, leave me. This is too much for me. You know, I've got quite a nice, quiet little business going here. My life is okay. My mother-in-law is a bit of a trouble at times, but generally speaking, my life is okay. So, I'm a sinful man, no one special. Just leave me alone. I'll go to the synagogue, I'll go to the temple a couple of times a year, but just leave me alone. But God doesn't leave us alone. So, uh, she feels this connection, she falls at his feet and tells him the whole truth. The whole truth. Now, how does she say it? What does she say? We don't know. But she's holding nothing back. She's as open, as defenseless, as humble as the rich young man the other day uh, when he said, well, I have done all these commandments. I've kept them since I was young. And then had, couldn't say anything more because he had opened himself in, in his true need, his true hunger uh, to, to Jesus. So the woman, in whatever words, in whatever information she gave him, she tells him the whole truth, which is, what does it mean when you communicate the whole truth to someone? It's yourself that you give, isn't it? It's not just information, it's not just your medical records. It's not just even the secrets that you have. I mean, we pass out our secrets uh, carefully to people. Elrod of Revo said that, thought this was not a bad idea, that you, you should test your friends before you give your whole self to them. But ultimately, you build up that trust that allows you to be wholly, completely truthful. So, anyway, in this instant, she, in one way or another, gives him herself. Daughter, he says, your faith has restored you to health. Go in peace and be free from your complaint. So, the tenderness of, of him calling her daughter evokes the memory of the daughter of Jairus who's waiting for him. And uh, he uses once again, as in many of these healing stories, the word faith to describe the power of healing. It doesn't say, I have, heal I have cured you or I have healed you. Your faith has healed you. He says that to Bartimaeus, doesn't he? Your faith has healed you. So what is faith then? Was faith, was her faith simply her desperate hope and conviction that if she could just touch the hem of his garment that she would be cured? Was that her faith? It was part of her faith. She had to have that belief, that conviction, otherwise she wouldn't have taken the risk of going into the crowd and breaking the social taboo. So that was part of it, but that was as if it, that was the belief part of it. But the faith itself is the relationship. When we talk about faith, usually when religious people talk about faith, they usually um, confuse it with belief. But faith 
is much better understood in terms of the way we use it, a faithful marriage, being faithful to a promise, being faithful to a friend, being faithful to a commitment that you've made. So it's about relationship. So your faith has healed you, means your participation in this relationship in which you have told and been wholly truthful, that is where the healing has taken place. And it has restored you to the wholeness that you had before, before you felt ashamed, rejected, isolated, cast out, uh, unclean because of this medical condition that you had. So, she was cured at the instant of touching him, but the healing took place subsequent to that, because she stayed and finished the job, finished the process. She listened to his appeal to her to reveal him, herself to him, to stay there, to remain there, as Jean was saying today, powerfully. This, it's about remaining in the relationship. If you just get cured and run, well, you've certainly been cured, you've got something out of it, but you haven't been healed and you haven't been restored to, to wholeness, to your full capacity for relationship, to your full relational solitude. You're still in the prison of your isolated individuality. You haven't been able to reconnect to your own unique self and identity. And therefore, you are prevented, you're still handicapped, you're still prevented from uh, entering into full comprehensive relationship. You're still controlled by your fears, you're still controlled by your guilt, by your shame. You can cope, you can manage, but you're only operating at, in fact, at half your capacity or less. So your faith has restored you to health. Go in peace. All these words piling up that mean so much. Health, peace, free from your complaint. These are all the, the words, theological terms, key words of the New Testament that describe the experience of, of faith uh, in relation to Jesus. So, faith is about relationship. Relationship doesn't get serious until there's a commitment. And it takes maybe a long time. Today, people may live together for several years before they commit to each other. And faith also therefore, of course, requires perseverance. That allows you to go through the stages of any relationship, from enthusiasm, from romance, to facing difficulties within the other person's character or the other people in the community, uh, or your own, or external circumstances that change the relationship uh, in the, and the way that it develops. So, perseverance for good or ill, in, in sickness and in health, riches and in poverty. So, that's the testing of a relationship. Is this the kind of relationship that is really going to be your vehicle into full health, into full freedom? And you have to, you, you will be tested in that, and you will fail. You will be unfaithful at times, and 
if it's meant to be, you will be healed from that. You will learn from that. You will be forgiven. You will give forgiveness, and the relationship moves on and grows deeper. So perseverance. And then, that is transcendence, because you're now transcending the external and the internal conditions that would make you otherwise want to run away. Just as the woman could easily have run away, melted into the crowd at that moment when he called out, not knowing who she was, called out, uh, who, who was it who touched me? So to transcend your fear, to transcend the ego's reaction, to avoid pain and disappointment at all costs, ego just doesn't like disappointment or, its, or to have its hopes uh, uh, shattered. So the ego, even before anything happens, when it begins to smell danger, or pain, or suffering, is going to say, run. Go back into your isolation. Don't risk solitude. And the same happens in meditation, as Jean has been pointing out. Because in some ways, the first relationship we have to wrestle with as we move towards full restoration to health, the wholeness, is our relationship with ourselves. We can't do it on our own, but we, but we have to do it. We have to find the right conditions, the right framework, the right community, the right person, whatever it is, or combination. We live in a great web of relationships, so there's plenty to choose from or we discover the particular configuration of relationships, intimate, communal, professional, that will allow us the best conditions to work on this relationship with ourselves. That's what meditation is. And the first fruits of meditation are found in the healing of our relationship with ourselves. That might sound a little self-centered, but it's really very good theology. Self-knowledge is the basis of our knowledge of God. And although Jesus says that the, the, the first commandment is to love the Lord your God with your whole strength, your whole mind, your whole heart, and your neighbor as yourself, there are three aspects of love. God, neighbor, and self. From another perspective, and from the psychological perspective, perhaps the order is reversed. At least it seems to be. That we have to learn to love ourselves first. And that's what meditation is. Is not paying attention to our egotistical needs and drives and fantasies, but cutting through that faithfully, cutting through that, and paying attention to that identity we have as a living icon of God, the image of God, the true self. That's what loving ourself means, not just indulging yourself but paying attention to, that, to our true nature. And as soon as we begin to discover that true nature and find ourselves lovable, amazingly, then the first sign of that is a change in our relationships with other people. A little more patient with the people who are taking up your space on the subway train. Uh, a little more patient with the people you're living with, with your children, with your partners, with your 
colleagues at work, with the members of your community. And then that uh, experience of attention expands and will continue to expand ad infinitum into the love of God. And then we understand why loving God is the first commandment. Because any love we experience for ourselves, for other people that can really be called love, pure attention, selfless attention, unconditional attention, that is God. Whoever loves knows God. But I think we don't, we can't break through the, the merely conceptual doctrinal uh, formulation of that truth unless there is an experience, and that's what contemplation means. An experience of this love which triggers the whole picture and the, the, the development of the whole picture in our consciousness. And that's why meditation can really be seen as a way of faith. Why it needs commitment. Why it needs perseverance. Why it leads to transcendence. And why in the Christian tradition, contemplation is seen as the work of love. What does that mean? Love is moving towards that state in which it's not just us loving God or God loving us, but it matures into that communion or relationship in which there is simply a dance between our self and God, between humanity and God, between the cosmos and God. A dance in which in which there is a, there is a, a distinct identities but not separate identities. And uh, this, this takes us right to the heart really of, of the Christian understanding of reality. Saint Irenaeus said, the beginning is faith. So this is relationship, commitment, perseverance, transcendence. The beginning is faith. The end is love. Because that's what we break into, into this infinite expansion of love. We see everything as love, as Julian of Norwich did. And the meaning is love. And Irenaeus says, beginning is faith, the end is love, and the union of the two is, what do you think? What does he say? It's more, it, well, I'm sure there's more than one answer, but his answer, guess. <coughs> beginning is faith, the end is love, and the union of the two is Okay, don't answer that. That's your question for the small groups. <laughs> what is it? <laughs> so, uh, okay, so uh, your faith has restored you to health, wholeness. Now you know what peace is, shalom. Go in that peace and be free from your complaint and go back home and convince your family and your, rel your neighbors that you are cured, and then maybe have a party, and then go out and get another job, and, and then uh, get back into fighting with your neighbors again, and, uh, and get back to ordinary life. This is what Jesus normally does. Usually he just sends people back to their homes. Get on with life now. He doesn't say to everybody, come and follow me, uh, you know, leave your mother-in-law and come and follow me. Uh, 
generally his, the, the, the meaning of health, the meaning of wholeness, is to bring this new life that you have been restored to back into ordinary life. This is the great Christian, the beginning of the great Christian affirmation of the ordinary that flows, of course, directly from the doctrine of the Incarnation. If God became human, and the meaning of that is that the human will become divine, then the ordinary uh, dimensions, the ordinary experiences, the ordinary relationships, the ordinary things of life are now permeated with this sacred significance. We don't have to look for something outside of the ordinary, really. We just have to see and, and touch what is permeating the ordinary. So go back and get on with your life. But don't forget, probably he would say, don't forget the meaning of what has happened. Okay, so he's still speaking to this uh, woman, probably it was a slightly longer conversation than was recorded here. When some people arrived from the house of the synagogue official, Jairus, to say, it's too late, your daughter is dead. Why put the master to any further trouble? Well, kind of very real this somehow, isn't it? You know, he's going to Jairus' house to, find, to see the daughter. He gets diverted, not distracted, but he gets diverted uh, from that trajectory, even if it's only for a few moments. Imagine you were in the emergency department of a hospital. You have to make these very difficult decisions. How much attention do you give to one patient who's been brought in from a car crash and another who's fallen off a roof? You know, how do you, how do you manage all the people you're, you want to look after? Anyway, it seems as if only in too human a way, uh, time has got the better of him. And the girl has died. And but Jesus overhears this remark of theirs. Jesus always hears things that are being said <laughs> and, uh, or feels things that are being done. And he said to the official, do not be afraid, only have faith. So again, totally centered, totally in the authority of his own presence. Most of us would have been thrown off balance by that. And he allowed no one to go with him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James, his close, closest companions. So they came to the official's house, and Jesus noticed all the commotion with people weeping and wailing unrestrainedly. So full, the full works, the ritual... Uh, uh, gr grieving process, just somebody pressed the button, it's all started. He went in, so he cut straight through all of that. Very focused, and, and says to them, why all this commotion and crying? Maybe it was because it was a little bit too automatic, a little bit too instant, a little bit too ritualistic. Anyway, the child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. So, what does he do? He turns them all out. You're in the way. I've got something to do. Get out of the room, all of you loud, noisy people. So, one minute they're weeping and wailing. Yes? And the next minute, they're laughing at him. Doesn't sound 
very genuine emotion, does it? So he throws them out, and uh, taking with him the child's father and mother and his own companions. So this is the intimate network of relationships in which he will then work. Can't work on the stage with all of this wailing and commotion and mockery and falseness, just with the people most intimately connected with the girl, the daughter, the parents, and himself, uh, and his own companions. So he goes into the place where the child lay, and taking the child by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, I tell you to get up. Yeah, a little literary echo of the, the older woman in the crowd, the daughter. The little girl got up at once, no fuss. It's very wonderful, these instant cures. So she just gets up at once and begins to walk about, for she was 12 years old. Not so little. At this they were overcome with astonishment. And what does he do? He orders them strictly not to let anyone know about it. He doesn't want to become uh, known for the, just for the wrong reasons or just to become a celebrity, a healer, physical healer. And then he tells them to give the girl something to eat. Well, we could talk a lot about uh, the, the physical or literal elements of the story. Um, and that they have some value. But the real meaning of the story, I think, is, is very clear that healing takes place in relationship. And healing is about being restored to life, not just biological life, but actually to, uh, to your social life, to your life in community. And the healing itself happens in an instant. It's very quick, these healings. It doesn't take long for that spark to transmit, uh, to, to carry from one person to another, and to bring about that deep shift, or change, or healing, or new way of living, it may only be the beginning of the process. Go back and get on with your life and put all of this into practice and understand it over the next 20 or 30 years. And you'll have other problems and you will die eventually. But the instant of healing is this timeless self-communication, this power or this gift of attention, I think, we could really describe it as being pure and powerful attention. And there's nothing more powerful than attention. Attention is deeply healing. As John has been saying, you know, it's about spending time with, giving time to. And in the affluent world today where people often don't have much time to spend with the people they love, sometimes they compensate, create substitutes for that with material possessions, with gifts, with gadgets, with 
games. But there is no substitute for the time that you give to another in this act of attention, which is healing and which carries, is the medium of this transmission of love and of self. And again, you know, we can see how meditation teaches us that because it takes time to meditate. You know, in, we're, we have a course uh, going on at the moment in Georgetown University Business School, and we've started a few days ago, and we asked the students, the MBA students, to meditate 20 minutes in the morning and 20 minutes in the evening. And they usually look a bit blankly when you say that, because they think, well, hmm. A couple of people drop out of the class, I think, after they hear that. But there's a waiting list now, so they fill up. So, how many of them do it? You'd be surprised. Uh, particularly the ex-Marines, because they're very disciplined. But uh, many, I would say most, most of them really struggle to make the time for meditation, which is what? Making the time to love themselves, to pay attention not to all the things they've got to achieve, all the papers they've got to write, all the inter job interviews they've got to go to, but paying attention to their deep and true self, which is actually what they're looking for and why, they, why, why any of us would sign up for something like this anyway. So, now, most of them actually also do develop some real daily practice of meditation. A few, 20 minutes in the morning, 20 minutes in the evening, before their five mile uh, run, you know, and very disciplined people, physically, emotionally. But the majority uh, will not do it every day to begin with, or will cut down from 20 minutes to five minutes. But they learn during that period of time, and because the class has created a community, a little temporary form of community, they have what we all need to learn this way of faith. Not of belief, because they don't focus so much upon the belief, the belief systems, some of them do, of course, make this connection between faith and belief, but not all of them. But we all need this community in which to learn to be faithful, to embrace our own unique challenges, our own unique difficulties, our own unique resistance, and to discover our own unique identity and, and value. Now, whether that is going to come through five minutes a day or 20 minutes twice a day, it's going to depend. But in, in each case, what is awakened through faith, your faith has healed you, your faith has begun to restore you to a greater meaning in life, you realize you're more than just your projects, your assignments, your, your career. All of those are important. That's ordinary life. But you're more than that. So what happens as you, we learn to meditate, and by that we learn how to be faithful in every aspect of our life, because faith is like a muscle that we develop. Meditation is like going to the gym and strengthening that muscle of faith and attention. And then that's how we begin to see the fruits of prayer, pure prayer. We begin to see the effect this has 
on you in your ordinary life. Origen said, we do not pray to get benefits from God. Let's repeat that. We do not pray in order to get benefits from God, but to become like God. But then he says, and then he says, praying itself is good. It is good in itself. You don't do it just for what you get out of it. And it takes some work and time and perseverance to break through into that unconditionality, just as it does in a marriage or in a monastery. You don't do it just for what you're getting out of it, even though you know you're getting something out of it, but that's not your driving motivation. That takes time to purify the ground of your beseeching, as Julian of Norwich says. So it takes time um, to, to break down that opposition between your will and the will of God. But then Origen goes on, praying itself is good, it calms the mind, it reduces sin, and it promotes good deeds. It calms the mind, you become more peaceful, less stressed, it reduces sin, so it shrinks the ego, makes you a little bit more aware that you're not the center of the universe. You can be a little bit more other-centered on more occasions. And see reality for how it really is. And it produces good deeds by itself, not because you're being a do-gooder, but because goodness is being done through you. Most of the time you don't even realize So, this is, this is the fruit of this healing work of attention. The attention that Jesus gave to Jairus, to the woman in the crowd, the unique attention, and then, of course, to, the, to Jairus' daughter, to the little girl. It's the fruit of the attention that we, we work with in meditation. And it's work because, of course, we are constantly being distracted. If you weren't constantly being distracted, it wouldn't be work. So it's time with, as Jean has been saying, the time we spend with each other. And not just the quantity of time, although there has to be a certain amount of quantity, but uh, it's essentially the quality of time that we spend. And that's is why this work of attention, this contemplative work in daily life, has such a transformative power in ourselves, in our minds, in our bodies even, and in our daily relationships. Because it brings us to that deepest level of attention, which is God's attention to us. We wouldn't be able to pay attention to God or to each other or to ourselves if God were not undistractedly paying attention to us uniquely and faithfully. If God blinked for a moment, <laughs> we'd all, we wouldn't be here. And that is the mystery of the mind of Christ. Because it's in the mind of Christ now that we can experience, at a human level, this unconditional and unbroken attention of God to us. Our times of meditation, day by day, year by year, introduce us more and more fully into that discovery. So let's just end with this. Uh,
Jesus, immediately aware that power had gone out from him, Jesus turned round in the crowd and said, Who touched my clothes? Who touched me? My daughter, your faith has restored you to health. Go in peace and be free from your complaint. <laughs>